Where the testimony you're about to give in this matter before the court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. He is in boy, O R K O W S K I. And how old are you, Rebecca? 34. How are you employed? At Oshkosh Defense and the United States Marine Corps Reserves. How long have you uh, been a member of the military? For 15 years. While serving in the military, did you come to know a man named Joshua Aid? I did, yes. Is Joshua Aid in the courtroom today? Can you identify him by what he's wearing? Yes. Can you just describe that? He's wearing a gray suit, black shoes, and a purple striped tie. Okay, the individual two to my left? Correct. Your Honor, I would ask that the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. Sure. Rebecca, I'm going to be asking you several questions about the history of your relationship with the defendant, but because many of my questions will be relative to what happened on August 4th, 2020, I need to briefly ask you a couple questions central to why we're all here today. Rebecca, on August 4th, 2020, were you shot in the head? I was, yes. Who shot you in the head? Joshua Aid, the defendant. Thank you. So we're going to talk in detail about that night a little bit later, but before we get there, I'd like to talk to you about the history of your relationship. Can you just describe how you came to meet the defendant while you were serving in the military? Yes, he was um, my senior enlisted advisor. My senior enlisted advisor? Senior enlisted advisor. At some point, did you and the defendant begin dating? 
You did, yes. And do, can you estimate about when that was? Uh, 2015 ish. Was there also a period in your relationship when you and the defendant lived together? Yes. Where did you live together? Um, at his residence in Monticello, Wisconsin. Are you able to estimate about how far Monticello is from Oshkosh? It's approximately two and a half hours drive. How long did you live with the defendant at his home in Monticello? Just a few months. After those months of living with the defendant, did you decide to move out? I did, yes. And why was that? Uh, for a few reasons. One was to be closer to work because I do work in Ashkash. Um, and also, Joshua is very scary to live with. When you moved out of his home in Monticello, what city did you move to? Ashkash, Wisconsin. And in spite of moving out, did you continue in a long distance relationship with him? Yes, I did. During the course of your relationship with the defendant, were there some specific incidents of violence toward you? Yes, there were. I want to talk to you about two specific incidents today. Can you tell the jury about an incident that occurred in 2016? I can. <clears throat> So in 2016, while I was living with Joshua, um, it was a weeknight, and he and I were both drinking, I think we ate supper, and he started getting angry, which he always does when he drinks, and my keys were, we were standing in the kitchen, my keys were on the washing machine, um, or the dryer right next to each other um, and I started getting nervous scared so I went to grab my keys a little bit to my left um, and I, I had a hoodie on so I put them in the, the pocket of the hoodie and Joshua tried to to get them from me um, off of his kitchen is I guess a den or an office uh, just another room and we ended up in that room Joshua ended up on top of me, so we fell. Um, he pushed me over while he was trying to get his key, my keys from my pocket. Um, during that incident, I did receive um, rug burn um, and several spots on my on my body. And then I think um, Joshua didn't end up getting my keys. He took them from me. He was able to get them from my from my pocket. Now, you mentioned that you were both drinking that night. How much had you had to drink? Not that much. Do you feel that you were in any way impaired that night? No. Okay. Do you feel that you recall the event pretty clearly? Yes, absolutely. Were you scared of Joshua during that event? Uh, yeah. Did you take photos of those injuries shortly after that happened? I did. I took them that same evening, uh, directly after the incident um, in his bathroom. I'm showing you what's been marked as state's exhibits 14 through 17. some pictures that you took after that incident? Yes, that is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish to the jury electronically. Any objection? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> Can you just describe what we're seeing here? Uh, you're seeing rug burn on my, the, my left shoulder, on the back there. Okay. And next, exhibit 15. Is that a close-up of that same rug burn? It is, and I apologize, that's my right, it, the view. It's the, my right. 
because that's where my tattoo is. So that's on my right shoulder. And exhibit 16. Can you describe what we're seeing there? What you're seeing there are, um, it's bruising, um, like his fingerprints on the, my back, on the, on my back side there. Okay. And exhibit 17. Again, bruising and, and uh, or rug burn. Okay. And were all those injuries incurred when Joshua took you to the ground during yes. that incident? Did those injuries cause you pain? Yes. Did you turn your cell phone over to Oshkosh police officers um, to allow them to download its contents as part of their investigation into what occurred on August 4th? I did, yes. And would those uh, pictures that we just saw in exhibits 14 through 17 have been on your phone? Yes, they were on my phone. Moving on to 2018, can you describe another incident of, of abuse that occurred then? Yes. So again, I was at Joshua's house. Um, we were planning for um, a meal with one of his friends. His friend's name is Lee Hildendorf. Um, so, Josh had been drinking wine all day um, in his mason jar with the ice that he liked to pour it out of his fridge. Um, I was not drinking that day um, at all. I had no alcohol. And Josh was getting visibly angry. Um, he just, he starts to make noises with his mouth and he starts to make comments and he starts breathing heavily and his face starts turning red. And all of that was happening. So I was starting to get nervous, I was starting to get scared because I could just feel it coming, something was going to happen. And he was starting to cook dinner in the kitchen. And off of his kitchen is what is called the stove room. There's a, a fire burning stove in that, in that room. And Josh has a lot of cool antiques to look at. He has a lot of stuff in his house. Um, one of the things that I was looking at was a handgun. Um, Josh owns a lot of firearms. And he had a handgun sitting on the coffee table in the stove room. And I had picked up that gun. Um, it was not loaded, it's a revolver. So if you don't know about them, when you look down, you can see if there's bullets in there or not. There was no bullets in, in that weapon at that time. Um, I cocked the gun back. Um, but I was unable to, to put it forward. I didn't know how I had never fired that weapon. Uh, Josh was still in the kitchen. I laid down on the table. I'm sorry, not the table. The um, sofa that was next to the coffee table um, and put the gun next to me. I was scared to ask him to show me how to uncock it um, just because I already knew he was getting, he was getting mad. So the gun was next to me. I started falling asleep. Um, Josh came from the kitchen to the stove room and saw you know, me laying there with the handgun and that made him even more mad. So um, a lot of times what he does is he starts walking, he'll start walking fast or he'll, um, he owns a, like a farm property. So there's a lot of places to go, right? The barn or outside. Um, so he started, just getting mad, I could tell again with his gestures and his facial expressions. So what I decided to do was pack my things and I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go home. Um, I just didn't want to be subject to, to what I could feel was coming. So I went upstairs, started packing my bags, um, got my bag to the vehicle. My vehicle was facing his home the back of his home and Josh was like in disbelief that I was going to leave because we were supposed to have supper with his friend so he was he was mad before he was just getting more and more and more mad as, as this time period went on and <clears throat> what ended up happening was I got my bag in the car Josh uh, I had one of my dogs with me Josh ended up throwing him in the front seat and there we were, my Suburban, um, Josh, and then me. So it's me, Josh, and my Suburban, and Josh would not let me get in my car at all. 
um, arguing about me leaving, nothing in particular, just arguing. My phone was in my back pocket, and he ended up coming, coming right on me, just right next to me and grabbing my phone and asking me, are you going to call the cops? Are you going to call the cops? Well, no, you have my phone. So I kept asking him for my phone back. I kept asking him for my phone back. I, must, I don't know how many times I kept asking for my phone back. I just wanted to leave. He wouldn't give me my phone back. So what I did was I hit him in the head um, because he wouldn't give me my phone back. So I, right after that happened, that's when he took me down to the ground and started choking me. Um, Can I stop you for just a minute? So yes. you say you hit him in the head. Can you just show the jury with a gesture how he was hit? Yeah, he was hit with my palm. Okay. On the, right on the side of his head. Okay. Uh, so then what happens next? So I <clears throat> hit him in the head. We went down to the ground. Um, he started choking me, strangling me. Um, <clears throat> I was having a hard time breathing. He would not, would not get off of me. Um, he was looking right he was looking at me but past me he just he wouldn't get off of me so uh, the next thing i remember is he did get off of me eventually and his friend lee um was he came over um i didn't see him come down the driveway i don't know how long he was there for but the next thing i remember was me getting into my suburban uh, locking the doors and starting to back out the driveway and then I saw Lee and him, Lee and Josh, um, and one of Lee's dogs, I think it was one of his new puppies, walking into the, the back of the house. He has a sliding glass door. And who is this Lee person in relation to Joshua? Uh, Lee, <clears throat> Lee and Josh met, I believe, um, at, at work. They're engineering contractors, so I think they met on a job. At, at, somewhere in Madison, okay. or in the area, somewhere around there. About how old is Lee? 70s? Okay. 70s-ish. And had you ever met Lee before prior to that incident? I did meet Lee. Okay. Can you just describe uh, meeting him or the extent of the communication or contact you had with Lee? Sure. Um, I, don't, I don't talk to Lee. I, I've only met him one time. It was at a, what is called a threshery down in, um, I believe it was in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, we just walked around that, that um, event and looked at the tractors and the steam engines and watched the tractor show at the end, but I didn't really talk to him that day. Him and Josh uh, walked in front of me a lot and talked, and even when we sat down, I didn't talk to Lee. I think I maybe gave him a hug before he left, before we left, but I, I mean, if not, it was a handshake. Okay. Now, this incident in uh, 2018, do you, did you have any injuries after you left Joshua's house? I did. <clears throat> I had uh, bruising on my neck, and I had an ex uh, extremely sore larynx. My throat was extremely sore for weeks after that. Show me what's been marked states exhibits 18, 19, and 20. Objection? Sorry, Your Honor. Do those appear to be pictures that you took shortly after the 2018 incident? Yes, I took those. Yes, I took those when I uh, arrived back home from Josh's house that day. Um, just asked to publish them to the jury electronically. Seeing there in states of 18. So that's my neck. Um, there's bruising. There's bruising on my neck. I know it may be hard to see because of the lighting, but that's 
see I was bruising his fingerprints were on my neck. Can I just go That's the other side of my neck. Again, bruising in there as well. Can I just 20? And that would be on the side of my neck with the red marks that are that's going down it. And those were all taken, I'm sorry, how long after the incident? The day of the, day of the incident. Now, as a little bit of time, the, well, the days that went by after that incident, did you have any ongoing health concerns related to what had happened? I did. I was very concerned about my throat. I had a lot of pain in my throat, and it was, it was sore, and it started becoming hard to swallow. Did you seek medical attention as a result of those symptoms? I did. I went to the emergency room in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Okay. And how did you tell the emergency room medical staff you had injured your neck? I told them that I fell off a ladder. And was that true? It was not true. And at the time that you said that, were you trying to protect the defendant? Absolutely. Were you still in love with him? Yes, I was. I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 21. Is that a certified copy of your medical records from that um, emergency room visit? Um, yes, they, this is. Okay. I would ask to uh, move that into evidence, States Exhibit 21. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Just to receive Exhibit 21. Can you turn to page 4 and read the highlighted portion? Yes. History, apparently a 915. 2018 fell off a ladder striking the right side of the throat, was evaluated at the VA on 9-24-2018 with x-ray, has not improved, and also now has developed pain along her right carotid artery, so she came to the emergency department for further evaluation. And again, that is all related to the pain you're experiencing as a result of the strangulation from Joshua A. Correct. That was the only reason I went there that day. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 22. Does this appear to be a text message exchange between you and the defendant between September 22nd, 2018 and October 16th, 2018? Yes, that is correct. In this exchange, do the two of you discuss what happened on September 15th, 2018? It does, yes. I'd like to read that with you, with you reading your messages to, sent to the defendant and me reading the defendant's messages sent to you. If you could turn to that last page of the report you're holding there, we're going to flip through this backward in order to read it chronologically. Uh, the highlighted message, message on that final page there shows a date of September 22, 2018. Is that from you to the defendant? Yes. Can you read that and we'll proceed backward from there? You're literally at a loss. Josh, let me remind you, you physically hurt me, slammed me to the ground, and in addition to choked me. I am sick and fucking tired of the abuse. 
Your head is in a very, is very clearly in a different place than mine. No regard for me at all, at fucking all. And you want kids with me? I won't put my kids in that situation. You don't know what to do? Start to take care of bettering yourself to start. And on the next page, the message from October 10th, 2018 that you sent, can you read that as well? <clears throat> You also told me, in quotes, we will work this out. Josh, do you even understand what you really did, mentally or physically? Putting your hands on me like that? My throat still hurts today, tonight, right now. It's been over two weeks. Telling me, I don't know if I treat you like a Marine or what. <clears throat> well, that's nice for a sergeant. Treat junior Marines like an enemy combatant and choke them so I can feel your pain. You said that, right? I wish you could feel the anger I have deep down inside of me. A female Marine at that. Outstanding job. I am so mad at you for treating me like your family instead of your partner, your friend. You hate your family, and all I've been trying to do is bring out the best in you. For us. Less to no alcohol, but we both like a drink to relax with. Got that. So who am I to judge? Except you keep taking it too far. You told me no smoking and I quit, for me and for us. You asked me to quit and I did. So you get the real deal, cranky me at times and I got that raw, but at least I tried. And uh, moving on to the page at the bottom, Mark 10.74, can you read your messages um, from October uh, 2nd? Uh, before I go to bed, I need you to promise me something. And he responds, okay, boo, and your response? Never put your hands on me like that again, ever. And he responds, promise. Yes, he did. And I'll move on then to October 3rd, and I'll read a message that he sent you, and we can proceed from there. So name your terms, boo. Start communicating to me. That's what I'm asking for. Let's start setting long-term goals. Plan. Let's talk about where we see ourselves in two years, five years. We never do that. We are running by the seat of our pants. Uh, I, I responded to Josh. I can't communicate to you how I ever really feel. But you put your hands on me again, so I really have nothing to lose, I guess, except my life, maybe. Your temper, anger, rage, being drunk all the time. You try to control me. You put your hands on me. Now, when you say there, you put your hands on me again, would you be referring back to the 2016 incident? That was one of them, yes. And now on 1044, could you read that message you sent to him on October 10th, 2018? I want you to think, I want to think you didn't mean to cause me sorrow or pain. I want to think you want me to be happy. I tell myself you want what is best for me, to see me in the sun, to be my friend and lover. But you told me some things the other night, things that made you sad and angry, yet you did them to me. You told me what happened between us is how your mom and dad were. This is not love or a healthy relationship. That is revenge. That is not me. I don't want to be in an abusive relationship. A hatred deeper than one can describe. We will not last, Josh, if this is how it is with you. I can't. I deserve more than that. Not because I'm entitled, but because I respect myself and my own experiences and hatred towards certain things. And he responds to you, I understand I'm not my parents. I refuse to live that life. Also, we need to fix it through communication. I need to execute a few stress-related changes on my side because I can't live like this and it's unfair to you that I'm losing control. And on 1019, you respond on October 10th? You already lost me on 9-15-2018, but keep living in your own world, Josh. No, I'm not. You don't tell me your relationship or life goals ever. My goals are not to have someone choke me, take me to the ground, intimidate me, abuse me physically, mentally, emotionally. 
those should be expectations I provide. I've docked at this relationship. Correction, sucked. I've sucked at this relationship. And if you could read your message on 998. Thanks for coming up here the last two days. I appreciate the effort, but we have a long ways to go. Real, hard, raw effort needs to be given from both of us. We won't last unless things change. Long, lasting change, not just when it's convenient. Consistency and trust. You said we have to expose our weaknesses to be truly in love. I agree, but I think we're past some of that at the same time. What happened that night will always be in my mind when we're together, and that makes me cautious, hesitant, unsure. I'm so mad about it. The sound of the gun being cocked back sounds clear as day in my mind, and unless you have more to expose to me that I need to know about, I think I've seen it all. I hope I've seen it all. I cannot take any more of this excessive drinking and you thinking everything is fine. I have taken steps. Maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. But I know deep down what I've done to better myself, to be better for myself, and I will continue to work on me and my well-being. I hope this makes sense. And he responds, it makes sense, boo, it makes sense. Now, going back to that message on 998, when, when you write, I'm still mad about it. The sound of the gun being cocked back sounds clear as day in my mind. What are you referring to? I'm referring to the choking incident day. So, how could I forget? There, oh, let me take you back. So I'm laying on the couch with the, the gun cocked. John walks, or Josh walks into the stove room. He is visi visibly angry. And I had mentioned I went upstairs to start packing my things, which I did. Uh, they were in the bedroom. When I came back down, Josh was standing facing the kitchen. I'm now facing the stove room, but we're standing chest to chest, right next to each other, right in front of each other. And he has the same gun that I had cocked back in his hand. It is not cocked at when I first see him. But what he ended up doing was cocking it and taking his arm with the gun in it and pointing it backwards. And I just kept asking him, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I want to think, think in my mind that I, I, I was able to talk him down from whatever he was thinking, but he ended up uncocking the gun and put it on uh, a record player. So while I went to put, at some point between packing my vehicle and, and leaving, I noticed that that gun then had bullets in it. So between me going upstairs and packing my things and meeting Josh again in, in the entryway, he put bullets in that, in that gun. And you're certain when you were looking at the gun, there were no bullets? Absolutely, you can't, you can't miss it. It's very, very, very obvious. Did that frighten you? Absolutely. No. That last message that we read together, that was from October 16th, correct? Where you're referencing him coming up here for the last two days? Yes, that was probably the weekend he came up. And after that weekend, did the two of you reconcile and remain together? I mean, we remained together, yes. I'd like to move forward now, Rebecca, to the spring of 2020. Can you tell me what happened in your relationship in the spring of 2020? I ended the relationship with, with Joshua. And why did you decide to do that at that point? I was tired of being scared. I was tired of, of fearing for my life. I I built up enough courage to finally finally end it with him. 
Where were you living at that time? I was in Oshkosh. Okay. Can you tell me your address? 1715 Minnesota Street, Oshkosh. Is that in Winnebago County, Wisconsin? Yes. What was the defendant's reaction to your decision to leave town? He was in disbelief, um, angry, trying to figure out what he could do or what we could do, but he was he was upset, very upset. And did he try to change your mind about leaving the relationship? He did. Did you have any concerns for your safety after breaking up with him? I did, and earlier in our relationship, um, I actually had a home system security system installed in my home um, and is that like a door alarm type of system or is it have cameras as well there are unfortunately no cameras it was it's an alarm system shiny has been marked the states is at 23 Any no you're is this a copy of text exchanges between you and the defendant from March of 2020 through August of 2020? Yes. Now I'd like to direct you back to the final page again because we're going to read through it backward again so that we can do it chronologically. Okay. Again with me reading the defendant's messages to you and you reading your responses. So on March 3rd, 2020, the defendant writes to you, I'm still confused. Just a few weeks ago you said you were thinking of moving in with me and talking about a five-year plan. I didn't realize I wasn't included in that. My mind is blown on this. I responded back the same day. I did think about moving in with you. I have for a long time, but you're controlling and I don't like how it makes me feel. And you're more controlling and angry when you drink. It's stressful and not healthy. And apparently you can't talk to me because I always get mad so you just hold it all in and then blow up at some point, also not healthy. And you don't think I have been by your side, even though I have been trying to be understanding from day one, even through all of your anger and excessive drinking. And he responds, I'm not controlling. At one point in our relationship, yes, because I feared you driving away and not back. And there's no excessive drinking anymore. My monthly bills exceed my income now, LOL. I can't afford to waste money. And yes, I have to hold, and yes, I have to hold in this till it bottles up. I agree, because you flip on anything I say like a light switch. We have grown and developed a lot, and I'm having a hard time seeing five years get flushed. So now, just a moment. So turning to page 33, I'd like to read with you next a text exchange between you and the defendant from March 9th, 2020, beginning on page 33 and continuing on to page 32. Again, with me reading the defendant's messages to you and you reading your messages to him. So starting with a message on March 9th, 2020, he writes to you, still not calling me, huh? I replied back, question mark, we're not in a dating relationship. You're sticking with that? And let me guess, we're not in a relationship so you don't have to reply to me? Yes, I, yes, I am. It was mostly the alcohol and the anger, temper, and other bad things that came with the drunkenness. When was I angry last? When did you see my temper last? And what are you talking about recently with the drunkenness? I don't understand how you can throw away five years. So now moving forward 
I'd like to read with you a text exchange between you and the defendant from April 16th, 2020, reading backward from the page marked 9 through page 8. He writes to you, are we still not in a relationship? I reply back, we are not in a relationship. Forever or how long? I'm not even sure. I don't know. Okay, I still don't understand. I never gave up on you and helped you through everything. And when I tell you I'm in a financial hard spot, you dip out. Now, on page 7, there's a text message from <coughs> May 5th, 2020, where the defendant states to you, from your short responses, it sounds like you don't want to talk to me and you don't call anyone. Did you respond to that text? I did not. So that was on May 5th, 2020. Then on May 11th, 2020, he writes to you again, how are you and the dogs doing? You never called me back. And your response? I did call you back. And he writes, I don't have any missed calls for the last two weeks. I replied back, okay, but I called you back. Okay, well, thanks for the call back. Then have a good night, boo. Please don't call me boo anymore. Why is that? We are not dating, and that's like a dating name. And I still can't understand why you broke up with me. I just can't comprehend how you go from me how you go from marrying you to moving in with me to cutting off in a matter of three months, boo. Now, after that May 11th text exchange, was there a period of time when the two of you weren't texting at all? So I'd like to move on to your next text exchange on July 29th, 2020, starting at the bottom of page four. Would that have been the Wednesday before the shooting? Yes, it was. Okay. And let's read that together in the same manner. He writes to you, I take it you just blocked me on Facebook. I didn't block you on Facebook. You were just, and as soon as I messaged you, it's like a surfboard, you were just what? You were just, and as soon as I messaged you, it went to, you may have been blocked. I didn't block you on Facebook. If you still want to talk to me, just text me or call me. Why haven't you called or texted me? Because you don't want to talk to me? Josh, the only thing I need to talk to you about is when I can deliver your stuff to your house. So you're calling it done forever? Yes. Now, can you describe what you're referring to when you say, Josh, the only thing I need to talk about is when I can deliver your stuff to your house? Yes. Josh likes to bring up things from his house to my house. Um, I don't know why he always asks me not to. Um, a dresser, different antiques to display in the house. Um, another thing he brought up was the Tahoe. Um, so that's what I was referring to is, is all of his items that he had put in my house throughout the years, delivering, you know, collecting all of those items to include the Tahoe and, and taking all that stuff back to his house. So moving on to page two, what is the date of that text exchange? The date on here is August 2nd, 2020. And was that two days before the shooting? It was. Can you read your text to him at the bottom of the page and we'll follow through on that again? Yes. Thank you. This was August 2nd, 2020, around 9.15 at night. Please stop blowing up my phone. I'm on the other line. Then call me back because you're lying about being on the other line. No, I'm not. I don't trust you. Well, I'm on the other line. With your new boyfriend? 
No. And what did you mean there when you said, please stop blowing up my phone? What was happening? You just kept calling nonstop. Throughout the course of your relationship, did the two of you also communicate through Facebook's Messenger app as well as the text messages that we just read? We did, yes. Showing you what's been marked as exhibits, or I'm sorry, as states exhibit 24. Does this appear to be a Facebook Messenger exchange that would track through from the week prior to the shooting? Okay. Yes, that is correct. Okay. I would move to admit and publish to the jury as we go through it. No, you're in. Where we see at Wednesday at 7 19 p.m., would that have been the Wednesday before the shooting? Yep, that is correct. Okay. And the messages that appear on the left are those messages sent by the defendant to you? Yes, Josh Abe. Okay. And the messages that appear on the right are those your messages to the defendant? They are. So there's two messages that say, Hey, you opened your page back up and still not talking to me, I take it. Are those both messages the defendant sent to you on July 29th? Yes. The next message appearing on the page there says, indicates it's from Sunday. Would that have been two days before the shooting? Yes. I'd like to read through this exchange and scroll through as we do that uh, with, again, me reading the defendant's parts and you reading your parts, carrying through uh, to August 4th. After we go through this, I'm going to ask you some sp more specific questions, okay? okay? So on Sunday, he writes to you, I see you changed your status to single. I replied, okay. I can't understand why you broke up with me. The day you broke up with me, and the day you broke up with me, you took money and a cooler of food, knowing you were dumping me. Like, what type of person does that? I'm perplexed. I even spent money to us a project SUV and paid to get it running and fixed. I just don't understand where things went wrong. I went through a divorce to be with you, and now for you to walk away, I'm fucking crushed completely demoralized. I helped you through so much stuff and spent so much treating you how you deserved as a woman. I don't understand. Maybe you found someone better, IDK. This has nothing to do with material things. You know that. I appreciate everything you did, and you also know that. This has everything to do with your alcoholism and the abuse towards me when you drank. You did not leave your marriage for me. Samantha left the marriage. I'm not sure how to reply to this message. If you think I'm an alcoholic, I guess it is what it is. And yes, me being with you caused my divorce. Takes two to tango, so you helped me with that. Maybe you could have helped me through a few tough spots I was going through instead of your comment. Josh, you're always in a rough spot. Never once did I not help you through anything you were dealing with and fully support you however I could, but you turned your back on me. Nothing I say will make you understand what I'm saying or how I feel, felt, and feel. It's unfortunate you think I never helped you with anything. You were too drunk half the time to realize, maybe. I was drunk half the time. I think you've lost your mind in your disrespectful comments because I was not drunk. I, I seem to remember me telling you several times I didn't want to drink, but you wanted to. I guess you're a different person now. It's amazing how you call me alcohol, an alcoholic. 
but I can drive clean to Vegas and back for you without drinking. But you can't even stay awake to help A drive because of the meds you're on. Medicine does make me tired. That's all you have as a comment? When are you delivering all my stuff back to me? I paid to bring it to you. You can pay to bring it back. Next weekend? You got a new SUV, huh? No, no one is helping me pay for this Jeep. You asked if my boyfriend helped me. No, and congratulations on retiring. That's great. So you're admitting you have a new boyfriend? Stop reading into stuff. I was just saying. Retiring is great because I can get back to a real lifestyle. It feels pretty good. The shit I've got done so far on the farm is amazing. Thank you. I honestly just wish we could make this work out because without you, I'm done. Sometimes you need people to lean on, and I could lean on you, and you could lean on me. That's gone. Well, you keep t telling me you did everything for me, and I didn't do anything, and I didn't do anything for you ever. Never by your side, so why would you want to work this out since I do nothing for you? I said you, you didn't help me in times I needed it, speaking mentally. You physically helped me out, yes. I got lots of ghosts in the closet that don't let me sleep at night, and I can't fix that. I have never even told you some of the stories because I, I just don't want to relive them. You want to know one story I've never told a soul in my life? I mean, if you feel like telling or venting about it, but that's up to you. And after he tells you that story, your next comment? I'm sorry you have had some really bad things happen to you. I really, really am. But that's anger and pain you have deep, but that anger and pain you have deep down gets lashed out at me at unexpected times, and it's not good. I understand, and I was trying to put all of that behind me to have you as a companion partner. But that's not where we are now, where we're at now, and I'm on my own again. I've been trying to go to Lee's once every two weeks now and talk to him. Agreed, it's not good, I fucking know that. You can't put it behind you because you haven't really dealt with any of it. You just keep burying everything and trying to forget. I know, and I no longer have you in my life to talk to every day, so it is what it is, I guess. And your comment tonight, everyone knows I'm a drunk, Hmm. Now it appears next that you send some pictures. Um, can you describe what those pictures are again? Those are the pictures from Josh strangling me and me circling on, on, my, on my phone. Okay. And the comments that you sent with those pictures? So right after I sent the pictures, I said, you want to know why I was scared of you? You put your hands on me, choked me, left marks. I thought you did some real damage. I went to the ER and lied to them about what happened. Domestic abuse. And that going to the ER, you're referring to that uh, certified medical record that the jury saw? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now the next messages are from Monday. Would that have been the day before the shooting? Yes. He writes to you, when did this happen? Because the photo has you wearing the same shirt as your Jeep photo. And what are the marks I'm supposed to see in the photos? It's not the same shirt, bruising. And he responds, I really thought you were going to be my life partner, friend, and spouse. I don't think you have any clue what you did to me breaking up with me. You gave me a straight double tap to the old blood pumper. You keep arguing everything I'm telling you with the drinking and abuse. You treating me well doesn't outweigh how I feel when you lash out at me. I don't deserve it ever. Those demons need to be directed somewhere else. I don't disagree. You should never be the brunt of my anger because you don't deserve it. What else do you want me to do to make our relationship work? I'm trying to socialize more. I got a dog that's helping. I'm getting the farm cleaned up because this place is a demon in itself and it needs to go. You wanted to move somewhere else with me. I'm not 100% opposed. I just think you need to settle some of the demons. They are deep and they are dark. You can't be 100% in a relationship if you're not okay with your own self. So how do we save this or is it too far gone? 
Josh, please listen. You need to go to counseling, someone you trust. So how do we save this, or is it too far gone? Why did you just ask me that again? Because you never answered it. I don't have an answer. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure stuff out too. You have an answer, you just don't want to tell me for some reason. In your heart, you already know if you still love me and have feelings for me or not. I've never stopped loving you, and I won't, even if I have to say, yep, she was my rock that got away. No, I don't have an answer. Stop assuming things. It's annoying. Of course I love you. I always will. You need to take care of your mental health. Settle the demons. How is your back and LOD process going? Slow. No response back, yet you can reply to Joseph Joseph. Josh, what the fuck? Why do I always need to explain myself to you? We are not together. Now if I stop right there, can you explain what he was referring to with Joseph Joseph? I had posted two pictures of a vehicle I had recently purchased. I posted two pictures on Facebook. And Joseph Joseph uh, is a co-worker. He works um, at Ashkash Defense. And he also has a Jeep. So it just triggered a conversation or started up a conversation. So he started posting pictures of his Jeep and that's what that's referring to. So did he appear to be upset that you were replying to a different man in a Facebook conversation and weren't replying to him? Yeah, yes. Uh, can you re repeat again your response to that? My response was, Josh, what the fuck? Why do, you, why do I always need to explain myself to you? We are not together. No, but it seems you two are. O-N-G. Well, he just sent you four more photos. I'm trying to fix what we had, and you just keep telling me we are not together. It kind of seems like you're stalking. Who cares what someone posted on Facebook, or who I'm talking to about a vehicle? Seriously immature. Not immature at all. I want this relationship fixed, and I'm extremely frustrated. And no, I'm not taking it out on you, but my gut is telling me that you already found someone else. And it's not a slow feeling. I've been feeling it for a while. I don't know, Josh. Your spider senses are off because I'm single. Single doesn't mean not dating. Maybe my spider senses are off. IDK. That's why I keep asking you because I'm trying really fucking hard to get back with you. I'm not going to continue talking about this because it's too much for me right now. This is not how a person tries to get back with someone. Have a good night. I don't know how to talk to you about a future relationship because you never give me a straight answer. Fuck, maybe I really wanted to open up to you about some stuff. You don't even realize I was saving a side pot for our wedding because I would never again do it willy-nilly. You are worth more than that to me and you deserved a proper full wedding. And then there's no response to you from that comment, his next message to you is still no response are you just not replying to me now josh i don't have much else to say maybe we could talk about a path forward or how to fix things saturday afternoon you dropping off all my crap got it that's one step in a direction of closure for you you should be there by 10 hundred all four of you yes and let me stop right there so Saturday afternoon, that was that when you were planning to do this exchange? The project? Yeah, that's when I was planning on dropping off his items. Okay. And um, who are you referring to with uh, saying yes to all four of you? It was going to be my dad, uh, James Grutner, my mom, my brother, and myself. Okay. And were you driving the Tahoe there as well? That is correct, after it was fixed. So you would need those people with you, I assume, to drive you away after you left the Tahoe? Yeah, correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, so moving on from there, uh, it appears that you're just uh, listing various items that uh, you're going to return to him, is that correct? Yep, okay. yes. So we don't need to really re read through all of those. Um, I'll start with his response to all of the items that you're returning. He writes, 
Then I have to buy batteries and a charger for it, don't I? I'll bring two batteries and a charger. I thought I'd use the expensive chainsaw batteries, right? Josh, I'm bringing it down. Don't forget you have four tires and rims to take back with, back with you also. Yep. So is that closure and then you're done with me? Please stop asking me that. After you answer it honestly, I will. Is there anything else I'm forgetting? So back to my question you won't answer. Is this closure for you? I think so. So no hope of us fixing this relationship we had. You're asking me the same shit, just different ways. No, I'm not. That was a complete different question. FYI, if I remember correct, all of your jewelry is insured, and you have an option that you can sell the diamonds back to them. Josh, I don't want what we had. We had a long-distance relationship for five years. Alcohol, verbal, slash physical abuse, and fear is not what I want in my life. I understand, so hopefully the next boyfriend treats you better than I could. Hey, I think Benny is single. Okay. Oh, you already probably looked at that path since you're abandoning me, I get it. Okay. Is that your, is that just a canned response now? Okay, okay, okay. What about the abuse you put me through? All mental, no physical. You ever think about that? No, please explain how I mentally abused you if you want. Hmm, helping cause a divorce, constantly calling me a drunk. I caused your divorce? How much time I helped you with USMC shit, even though I had my own to do. Ever heard of a home record? Wow. It takes two to tango, and if you remember, you were calling me and texting me every night while I was married. Then Samantha got a hold of my phone with the photos you were sending me. My divorce, while I don't blame it on you, was one of the hardest things I ever had to go through. And all I wanted in the end was to be with you. And now you're taking that from me as well. As well? As well wasn't the proper term, taking that from me. We invested so much time into each other, it's sad to see you abandon that. A lot of things are sad, Josh. All I'm asking is that we give it another try. I got it, five years of long distance is a lot. But that's where we failed each other, to not meet in the middle and find a mutual home. Financially, I could probably turn out a pretty good sale on my dad's and this place. I don't want to be here forever. It's a bad zone for me. And that is down payment for a real home, not the shithole I live in. I was and still am too afraid to move in with you. I lived with you for a few months and I was scared. You talked about moving in. How, how am I supposed to do that when every six months, months my kitchen sink is clogged with rust? Boo slash Becky, those were different times. I was going through a divorce. Do you have any clue how hard that was? Oh, and then add that I lost my job. I think maybe you should work on finding who you are and focused on healing or something. What are you talking about, healing? I love the fuck out of you and just can't comprehend that going away. Lay down my life to protect you, sort of love. Healing from your pain and anger. Yeah, I was hoping you would be by my side to help. I tried the whole relationship to be by your side through all the stuff and all the times I wanted to leave. But I realized I can't help you in the ways you need it. So I started making positive changes about things I need to do and work on. I disagree. I think you are helping me and I could see the difference in myself. Yeah, well, it didn't seem that way. But what do I know? I'm just a selfish bitch, homewrecker, and someone who used your time. You have said plenty of hurtful words to me also. Oh, and I have a drinking problem. Can't forget about that. You admitted that one to me. And you have admitted nothing. I have admitted everything to you and shared some deep stories I've never told a soul before. Deep stories, yes. I have told you I, I had a drinking problem and went to counseling. I even asked you to come with me for the second to last session, did you? No, I didn't, you know that. That wasn't a burn, that was just my effort to show you I was trying to be a better person for myself and for you. I really wanted you to come, truly it did, so it would be proof I was doing what I said I was going to do. You should have said that, Josh. You're saying all this stuff now. 
You know for a fact I'm not good about saying shit. I asked you to come. That was my effort. You shrugged it off in a sense. I still went and had to tell the lady you weren't available to come. If memory serves me right, your comment was, do you really want me to come? And my reply was yes. I'm sorry, I'm a selfish bitch. No, you're a good woman, but you're a good woman, but standing side by side with me when I'm trying to be a better person, help you help you and deal with all the fucked up stuff in my life and trying to get you to come to counseling with me. It didn't work. Didn't say that was selfish of you. All I said was I openly invited you to be by my side for the last two sessions with her and you weren't there. No fault of yours, maybe I didn't convey a strong enough message of how important that was to me. Not good, I, I'm, I'm not good at that, I, I got it, but I wanted to prove it to you that I was taking steps to get better for me and for you. So after those several messages there, it appears that you didn't respond again on Monday, the day before the shooting. So now I'd like to move in to the text from Tuesday. Would that be the day of the shooting on August 4th, 2020? Yes. Okay. So he starts with a message to you. Response, I thought the Tahoe had a cracked radiator. How are you going to get it back here? And if you drive it and it blows the radiator, which one of us is liable for the repairs? 50-50 or what? I have a spare engine for it that is bored 0 .030 over to add horsepower, which was going to be a surprise to you when I took it in. When I took it in, it was going to get a swap and be a beast. Along with me working with Lee's Body Shop to find a fender that matches and repaint the stupid bumper. So it appears that you didn't respond to any of those messages at either 8.27 a.m. or 10.09 a.m., is that correct? That is correct, I was working. Okay. And he responds to you that day at 1.18 p.m. saying, still no response. And so I'll ask again, how are you planning on getting the Tahoe here with the cracked radiator? I responded back, taking care of it, Josh. And how is that, since it's my property, I would like to know. I'm replacing it. How else do you think one would fix it? You? You are or a body shop is? I am replacing it. Not happening. No way. Stop whatever you are doing. You didn't even ask or discuss with me about working on it. Well, it's half mine. Half yours that you paid zero for and did zero work on. And since it's half yours, you didn't discuss half of it with me. You're annoying. I give two shits if I paid for it. You wanted to buy it for me, and yes, I did put a little money into it. Fifteen dollars? No, Josh, I don't remember. Don't have all of the invoices in front of me. I'm annoying. You're, you're taking a radiator out of an SUV without discussing it with me. Yes, annoying. How about I drive up and help? What day are you doing it? Tonight or tomorrow, probably. I found a mechanic, so no need to drive up here. Send me their phone number. I want to talk to them quick, because that undershield isn't going to play nice, and I think we modified some stuff that engine isn't stock. Not sure what he did cam-wise, or if he modified that cooling system, but he mentioned he did some stuff to it. Josh, I looked at the radiator. It's like five hoses to unhook. I can call him quick and ask or connect him. So you're still doing it yourself? Those five hoses aren't all cooling, by the way. I'm not doing it myself. I just said that. That has a tranny cooler and I think an oil cooler in it also. Send me the number of who is doing the work. I sent him John's number. And he replies, that number doesn't come up as a shop and it shows Madison as its location. You asked for the number, so call him. Just did. Are you fucking me? Correction, kidding me? You told him not to show up? And what are you talking about there? I am talking about Josh communicating to John Miller that he was not allowed at my house. So Josh told John not to come up. Josh, Josh. Okay, and how was that communicated to you? From uh, via my mom. 
And then after that, he responds, is he your new boyfriend? Because he ain't a certified mechanic. You don't get to choose who comes to my house. He can replace the, radi the radiator. And you don't get to choose who comes to mine. That's fine. Your stuff will be dropped off by the road then. He must be sitting right next to you, huh? Josh, we are never getting back together. You have issues. Is he sitting right next to you? Still being abusive and controlling and intimidating. Not abusive or controlling. All I want at all, I want it done right, and going independent contractor is not right. Leave me alone. I will pay to have it done right by a professional. No, I wanted the fuck out of here this weekend, and everyone is booked. I found a mechanic. Becky, I want it done right, not half-assed. Call him off, I'll find someone to do it by the weekend and cover the cost. A fucking mechanic can't do that in your driveway. You have to purge three systems. Uh, and you were going to do it in the barn? Yes, because I was going to buy the tools to do it in a tranny flush at the same time, because you have to purge that as well. I'm not doing a tranny flush. I am literally just swapping a radiator. The tranny cooler is in the radiator. One side is coolant and one side is tranny fluid. Josh, you know. Correction, I know. So... The next message appears to be two messages from him on Tuesday at 4.18 p.m. He writes to you, you still actually online? I'm on the phone with Lee. He said we will call a U-Haul and tow it ourselves. Don't touch the radiator. Is that the final Facebook exchange you received from him that day? Yes, that is correct. So, in spite of the Tahoe being titled in both of your names, your plan was to return that to Joshua for him to keep it. Is that accurate? That is accurate. I was going to replace the correct radiator and sign the title back over to Josh. Okay. And I apologize if I've already asked you this, but why did you view it as urgent to get the radiator replaced? I, I don't know if I would say it was urgent. It just, I. My brother was going to be in town, and that's when I had the help to help me physically drive two cars to Josh's place and then come back. Okay, let me rephrase that. Did you believe there would be problems with the, or potential problems with driving the vehicle that distance with a cracked radiator? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It had a, a fracture, a hairline crack, and I just, I had taken it to a mechanic shop, a certified mechanic shop in town. Um, in Oshkosh previously for some other work that I had done um, to it and he said hey did you notice this hairline fracture so I wanted to fix that before driving it two and a half hours. Sure. And was that repair that day just with the goal of being able to complete this property exchange and finally be done with your relationship with the defendant? Yes that is correct. How did it come to be that, um, that, well, if I haven't asked you this, who was going to help you with that fix? The fixing of the radiator? Yes. That was going to be my dad, James Grutner, and a uh, friend, John Miller. Okay. And had your dad recently moved back to the area? He did. Um, him and my mom uh, lived in Nevada for 10 years approximately, and he was working on taking a job transfer back here in Wisconsin. Okay. And who is John Miller in relation to your family? He's just a family friend. Who did you meet him, or who did your family meet him through? Uh, my family met John through Carla. Carla and my mom are, were good friends. Had you ever personally met John prior to August 4th, 2020? No, I have not. Do you know when your parents first met John Miller in person? I think it was that day.
Did you make plans to meet your father and John Miller at your residence to repair the vehicle on Tuesday, August 4th, 2020? That is correct. My dad and John decided to drive up from my dad's home to Oshkosh. How, how far was that drive for them? Hour and a half, okay. depending on traffic, maybe two. And did you actually tell the defendant that you were going to be doing it that day? Uh, in the Facebook message, I said tonight or tomorrow. with you to your text message exchanges from 2020, which would be State's Exhibit 23. I'm not sure if you have that right with you. I want to talk to you about one text message in particular. So we just discussed that the last Facebook message was at 4.18 p.m. Prior to that, was there a text message sent by you on August 4th, 2020 to the defendant? And I'm directing you to what shows up as number four if you're looking at that first page of the messages? Yes, that is correct. Can you describe well, the message that is sent to the defendant at 318 that day says 1715 Minnesota Street, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54902. Did you send that message to the defendant? Unfortunately, yes. And can you just explain what happened there? So, as mentioned, John, my dad had just moved back from Nevada to Wisconsin. Him and John, my dad and John were going to come up. I did, did not know my address, so what you're not seeing is the phone conversation of my dad asking me to send him a text message. Uh, unfortunately, I accidentally sent this to Josh, and then immediately after, I just sent it to my dad as well. And Josh already knew your address, correct? Absolutely. He'd been to my house numerous times. He knew where I lived. Okay. And the Facebook messages that we ended with where he's telling you not to touch the radiator, those messages were sent after that accidental text message, right? That is correct. I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 25. page there, does it appear to be a text message that you sent to your dad? Yes. Okay, and uh, can you just read what the text message says? The text message says 1715 Minnesota Street, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54902. And does that indicate it was sent to your dad on the, on the exhibit there? Yes, that is correct. And uh, what time does it indicate that that was sent? 318. And you testified that that was sent immediately after you mistakenly texted your address to the defendant? That is correct. The state would just ask to move that exhibit into evidence. The objection? No, you didn't. Except you receive exhibit 23. Mark 25. 25, I'm sorry. Oh, 23 as well, if that hasn't been admitted. Thank you. Um, were you also communicating with the defendant by phone that day? Yes. Okay. And during those communications, did you tell him that you did not want him to come to your phone? That is correct. I did tell him that. Did you have any idea he was actually planning to come? No, absolutely not. 
And even after sending him that mistaken text at 318, did you talk to him by phone? I did. I had talked to him after that on the phone, yes. I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 26. Does that appear to be a call log from your cell phone? Yes, it does. I would ask to move that state's exhibit uh, 26 into evidence, Your Honor. Any objection? No, no. Except we receive exhibit 26. So if I could just ask you to turn to page 17. And this, again, will kind of be tracking backwards to move through a chronological timeline, Rebecca. Okay. So on page 17, there is a call 126. Is that an outgoing call by you to Josh? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And what time was that call? That was at 4.54 p.m. And how long was it? Eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. And same page, but moving on to call 124. Is that an incoming call from Josh? Yes, that is correct. And what time is that call? I was at 5.02 p.m. And how long is that call? Approximately four, four and a half minutes. And call 116. O116 was from Joshua to me at 5.08 p.m. for approximately a minute and a half. And call 110. That was from Joshua to myself, 5.12 p.m approximately 12 minutes, well, 13 minutes, okay. approximately. And call 109? That was from me to Josh, um, approximately 5.30 for 16, uh, 15 and a half minutes. And can you just summarize what you guys were talking about in those calls? We were talking about the Tahoe, Josh not wanting me to fix the Tahoe. Um, we were talking about how he still couldn't understand that I broke up with him. We were talking about ways that he thought now is the time to try and fix this relationship again. So most of it was either relationship related or the Chevy Tahoe. At any point during any of your conversations with him that day, did you ever invite him to your home? No. And how did he sound in those calls? Were any, was there anything notable about the sound of his voice when you were talking to him? Uh, when Josh drinks and he, he starts elongating his words, um, Josh is a highly functional alcoholic, so he doesn't necessarily start slurring words right away. Um, it's more of an elongating of words, and sometimes he'll start laughing. Normally, he doesn't. he's not much of a laugher, so he was laughing on those phone calls um, as well, and I just, just from knowing him and being with him for so long, I just knew he was, he was drinking a lot. And how did your last call with him end that day? With him asking with me asking him to leave me alone um, and stop calling me. Um, he was angry, we were fighting, um, again, about the Tahoe and, and the relationship. 
At some point, did you just stop answering your phone? I did. Um, when I, so I drove from my home to the auto store, and when I returned home is when that one of those last calls was made. Um, my Josh, uh, my dad and John were standing outside on the front lawn. Um, and finally, what I decided to do was just back my Jeep into the driveway and just put my phone in the Jeep, in the car, and just let it be while we started to work on the radiator so we could say speed up the process, but just start working. Sure. I want to move on now to the shooting itself on August 4th, 2020. Can you tell me approximately what time your father, James Grutner, and family friend John Miller arrived to help you fix the radiator? I think it was 4.30 or 5. And where was the Tahoe physically located on your property? Uh, the Tahoe was backed into my garage. If you look at States Exhibit 1, does that appear to, uh, I'm sorry, and it's, it's the map behind you there. Does that appear to be a map of Minnesota Street? Yes. Okay. Yes. And can you point to your house? Well, let me get you out. We've got a laser pointer I can hand you here, make it a little easier. So you were pointing to your house, the house marked 1715? Uh, yes. And you, is it correct that you have a detached garage? That is correct. Can you point to that on the map as well? Okay, and you're just pointing to the building to the west of the house there in the back? Yes. Can you tell me on that map where any doors would be to your house? There's a front door, and there's also a side door. The front door is right there. So on the east side of the house? Correct. Okay. And then there's a side door. On the north side of the house? Right there. And then there's also a door upstairs. It's a second story door. Okay. But it's not, it's, it, there's no ladder or stairway to get up there. Okay. No porch. So from the west side where the garage is, there's no doorway to enter into your home from the west side, correct? Right, on the first floor, yes. So I'm going to put up a few exhibits as we go through what happened that night. Um, if we could just put up exhibits two through four. Does that depict your house, Re Rebecca? Yes. Okay. And moving on, is that your driveway? Yes, on the left side. Okay. And the next one, and just a close-up of the driveway? Yes. Okay. Now, can you tell the jury what happened that night as you remember it? I can. Go ahead. Your Honor, I guess I'm going to object to the full narrative nature of this question. Ooh. You can go ahead, Rebecca. <clears throat> so that evening, uh, afternoon, um, as I stated, my dad and John arrived at my house. They had backed uh, the Ford Focus into my driveway. Uh, so his trunk was facing my, my garage door. That's where the toolboxes were. So it just gave him easier access to take the toolboxes out of the car, place them on the ground while we were getting ready to work. Um, I also had backed my Jeep in. Um, there was a patio table 
in the backyard or on that back concrete pad. We just use that for drinks and um, keys, whatever. So we were working on fixing the radiator. Um, it took a few hours. The, the radiator was, it came out relatively easy. It went back in relatively easy. There was a few hoses that were, gave us a little bit of trouble, but it was all in all able to come out and a new one to go in. All hoses were able to be hooked back up. So as we were starting to close, you know, we were wrapping up the, the radiator swap. Um, I was standing next to John. Uh, we were looking over the, the radiator. So if the radiator is in front of me um, and I'm looking at the hood, John was standing to my right. He was also uh, looking under the hood. We were just wrapping, wrapping up that project. Um, and we were just standing there talking, um, getting ready to start putting tools away. And the next thing I knew, I had looked to my right, and there was Josh. Um, at first, he just kind of—I just kind of looked at him, and he said, "Hey, Boo, what you doing?" And I went to turn. I didn't say anything to him. I just went to turn because I was starting to put tools away. I had a 10 millimeter socket in my hand and. I had turned to the left to put that in to the toolbox. Um, it's a relatively tight space. There was a lot of things in my garage. So I went around the Tahoe to put that away. John had started going to the right because that's where one of the other toolboxes was um, to start putting away his tools. And when I put the socket down and I stood up and I turned around, there was a laser pointed in the middle of my forehead. And I said, what the fuck, Josh? And I had, he had fired, he tried to fire when that laser was on the middle of my forehead and he missed and I was able to move just enough. And um, the next thing I knew is I was uh, falling. Um, I kept saying I was flying. I really, I thought I was, I thought I was gone. I just, I was, I fell and, and the next thing I knew was, uh, I saw, I, I was on my side. I had woken up and I had seen a police officer next to my dad's Ford Focus and my eyes shifted to the right and that's where I saw my dad laying. Um, I remember saying help. Um, I remember my dad wasn't moving, um, but I, I, I had also just woken up or come to and I was uh, vomiting and um, my, my ear was ringing really, really, really bad. I remember feeling it because it felt like, I did just something, it didn't feel good. So um, I remember touching that and, and seeing the blood and I just started screaming help. Um, When you came to in the garage, were you even aware that you'd been shot? No. I'd like to show you States Exhibits 27 through 31. Those appear to be photos of your yard and garage as they would have existed that night. Yes, this is, that, is, that is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish to the jury electronically. The objection? No. Except to receive exhibits 27 through 30. Now, Rebecca, I'm going to ask you a few questions and I'm just going to hand you this mic because the laser doesn't work on the TV screen, so I might need to ask ask you to stand up and point to something. Um, because it's being through the speakers, I'm just gonna give you this mic to take with you if you stand up. So, 
that first exhibit there, can you point to, oh, I'm sorry, um, Shiny Oak State's Exhibit 27 there? Does that appear to be your yard? Is it what it existed that night? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And can you point to where you and John would have been standing when you first noticed the defendant come onto your property? As I had mentioned, we were standing over the Tahoe. I was around this area, and then John was next to me on the right. Josh uh, came up and met us on that side right there. Okay. And then what happened with the tool? What, what happened next? Where did you go? I had gone, um, I guess behind the door, you can't see it, but there's a toolbox laying on the, there was a toolbox laying on the floor, so I went this way to put that, that tool away. Okay. And, and where did John step to then? He went to the right, okay. looking at the picture. Now, moving on to Exhibit 28, where would you have been in that picture there? So originally I was, again, standing over the Tahoe here, mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a toolbox. The toolbox is right here. Okay. Um, so just a little bit in and right there. Okay. And moving on to Exhibit 29, um, is that just described or does that just show a little more into the garage, I think? It does, and it, it shows the toolbox. I don't know if you can see it, but it's right there. Okay. And Exhibit 30? And that's the toolbox. So that's where you went to put away a tool? Right. And moving on to Exhibit 31, that staining there, would that have been about where you, where you were laying after you fell? Yes, the blood stains. Um, that's all the pictures I'm going to need you to stand up for for now, so you can just have a seat. When you first saw the defendant in the moments before you were shot, how would you describe his appearance? He looked the same as he always does when he's drinking, red in the face, glossy eyes, um, elongating his words. Did you witness anything that night regarding what happened to your father? No, I did not see my dad. Okay. And do you remember where he was when you last saw him or last remember seeing him? My dad, no. And did you witness anything that night regarding what had happened to John Miller? I, no, Josh shot me first. And is seeing police officers the very next thing you recall after coming to? Right, on the side of that, the, the focus before focus the car. When you first began talking to officers or when they first made contact with you, what was your physical condition? Um, not great. I was bleeding from the ear. My head hurt really, really bad on the right side. Um, I started um, Vomiting. I just, I, my, it was like the room was spinning. I just was not able to, to stand up on my own, that's for sure. I'd like to show you a video of yourself from that night so the jury can observe your condition. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, it's on the thumb drive exhibit 7, labeled 7C, root camp 1. And I'm going to be playing from 116 to 153. And if we could just turn the lights down too.
Fifty-six to three forty. All right, can I? Can you, you can't walk at all. I, if I can get you out of here, that'd be best. Yeah, I can get off. You, you want to stand up? Now if we could just play 520 to 650. to the hospital by ambulance? I was, yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 32. to be a portion of uh, your certified medical records from the night of the shooting? Yes, that is correct. If you could just turn to the uh, tabbed page and read the highlighted portion. Blood alcohol is non-detectable. A CT of the head and cervical spine without contrast completed with impression. Plastic injury related to gunshot wound with entry site along the posterior ear and mastoid region with comminuted fracture of the right occipital bone and severe small bone and potential bullet fragments along the right inferior, cerebular hemisphere with a small amount of intracranial hemorrhage and gas, but no significant mass effect. Bullet is lodged in the soft tissues along the uh, posterior occiput. 
Your Honor, I would just ask to move that to, uh, State's Exhibit 32 into evidence. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Except for Exhibit 32. I'm going to show you now what's been marked as state's exhibits 33 and 34. Do those photos depict your injuries from the night of the shooting? Yes, they do. Your Honor, I have moved to admit State's Exhibits 33 and 34 into evidence and publish them to the jury electronically. Any objection? No. Is that a photograph of your injuries from the night of the incident, Exhibit 33? Yes, that is correct. And can you just describe for the jury where the bullet entered, just because it's a little bit difficult to see there? So you're pointing to the spot in the upper area of your ear there? Yes. And Exhibit 34? Is that just a close-up of that same spot that you had just pointed to? Yes. Did you provide the same account of what happened to officers who responded immediately after the shooting? Yes, I did. I'd like to play for you just a portion of that video and we can go through what you're reporting there. This is, uh, again, Rue Camp 1, which is 7C on the thumb drive, Exhibit 7, 2936 to 3230. One more time. I'm sorry. 2936 to 3230. So did Josh say anything before? He said, hey, boo, what are you doing? And that was on the phone, or was that? It was, on the, it was when he was there. Hey, boo, what you doing? Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? I saw the laser, and I said, Josh, what the fuck? How are you feeling right now? Tell me. Feel what? My head hurts. Your head hurts? Really, really, really hurts. Yeah. Do you remember at all what happened to your head? No, I jumped. You jumped? Did you fall and hit the ground? I don't remember, guys. Okay, did you lose consciousness? Yes, okay. I was flying. Why I go? I was flying. You were flying? Yeah. Okay. So when you yelled, Josh, what the fuck, what, what happened next? He pointed the laser at me. The laser is on the gun? Yep. Okay. And at that point, is that when you started running? Yep. And where were you when you pointed the laser or the gun at you? I was in the garage. You were already in the garage? Yeah. So did you tuck yourself into that corner or yes. okay? So she did you did you see did you see him fire any rounds? Yeah. It's okay, Rebecca. We're just trying to get as much information as we can, okay? Nope. He pointed the, I don't remember, he pointed the laser. Perfume smells good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he smells good. So you caught yourself kind of in that corner in the garage. Yeah, yeah. And you jumped. And then you started feeling pain. You, did you hear anything or see anything that you can remember? say or do anything? Oh. You don't remember. That's okay too. So John ran from the garage to the driveway. 
what happened after that? Do you remember any? Okay. Flying as in like ducking down or running or what? No, I was flying. 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 I was flying.
39 minutes. Is that that 380? Oh gosh, no. He said it's done for so long, I have no idea. So that 380 is older. Yeah. And then did it always have the laser sight on it or did it? That I remember of, yeah, in the last four and a half years, yes. So, okay. Four and a half, five years. Did you mention Crimson Talon? The Crimson Trace is the one that I have my done. Okay, that's what you have. Okay. That's green. This is red. This is red. And do you know if it came like that from the factory? Mine did. And it sounds like Detective Robertson is picking up saying, you might, oh, he said you mentioned Crimson Talon. Did you correct him and say Crimson Trace? Is that the 380 that was not located by officers the night of the shooting? That is correct. So does that refresh your recollection? Did you talk to officers about that 380 the night of, or while you were still in the hospital? When I was in Prater, yes. Okay. Did you bring that additional firearm to officers? I did, yes. And did you voluntarily turn it over to them? I did. Do you have any recollection of where that firearm would have been located the night of the shooting? In my home. It was in, it was in, I had it, um, I have a concealed carry, and that's the handgun I take with me when I walk my dogs. So I just, I keep it in a purse. Can you describe the purse that you keep it in? Uh, yes, it's like a cream handbag, so it goes over my shoulder, and then it has a, a pocket that I can put the, you know, put items in. I'm showing you what's been marked as States Exhibits 35 and 36. Are those photographs of your living room as it would have existed the night of the shooting? Yes. I would move to admit to exhibits 35 and 36 and publish to the jury electronically. Any objection? No. Now, Rebecca, I want to direct your attention to that rocker chair that's um, on the right there. Um, I'm going to show you the next exhibit, 36, which is zoomed in on that chair. What am I looking at in that picture? So that's a zoomed in picture um, of the chair in my living room. What you'll see is a chair, pillows, a towel, and a purse that I would take. You see, you can see the handle of the purse okay. that I would take with me when I would walk my dogs. Okay. And would that have been the purse that you would have had, that 380 that wasn't collected the night of the shooting? Would that be the purse that the 380 was in? Yes. How many days were you hospitalized after you were shot? until August 13th. At the time that you were in the hospital, did you have any knowledge of family members going into your home? No, not when I was in the hospital. Do you know if um, your mom or another family member was coordinating things that needed to be done in your house, like dealing with your pets or any other issues that would come up in your home? Um, I had coworkers come help with the pets, and my aunt was helping uh, try to coordinate, um, I think it was the mail, my mail getting delivered from the USPS. Have you remained fully cooperative with officers in their investigation in this case? Yes, I have. Have you given them everything they've asked for to investigate this case thoroughly? Yes. 
Did you even consent to providing a DNA sample to allow officers to test any blood found on the scene? I did, yes. What happened with the bullet that was lodged in your head? Uh, it was removed uh, via surgery. I started having, I refer to it as a, a light switch when I would put my neck down. Um, I started getting a shock to my entire upper body um, and it, it started uh, very gradually and then it was consistently getting worse. So I went into the, the neurosurgeon at Freighter um, and we ran multiple tests to see if he could pinpoint. Surgery was the last option, but it was the option he recommended. Did you have that surgery? I did, yes. And do you recall approximately the date? As the end of December, okay. and 2020. As, okay. And as part of the surgery, they removed the bullet? Yes. Are you aware of a detective coming to Freighter to recover the bullet from your head after it was, or from the medical staff after it was removed from your head? Yes. At any point on the night of the shooting, did you threaten the defendant in any way? No, <clears throat> no, absolutely not. Did you observe your father, James Brutner, or family friend, John Miller, threaten the defendant in any way? No. No further questions. Now it's time for a break. Get downstairs for a break, thank you, gentlemen. We'll bring back up here in 10, 15 minutes. Okay, we're back. Thank you. All right for the jury. No, Your Honor. Thanks. No, sir. See you at 2.55.